This is Happiness Solved with America's Happiness Coach, Sandy Scarlatta. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am so happy you're here. So before I introduce today's guest, I want to share with you my four simple tips on self-love. You see, so many people are looking for love, and what they do not realize is that they need to learn to love themselves first in order to have a healthy, loving relationship with someone else or their soulmate. In a Psychology Today article by April Eldemeyer stated that more self-love will attract healthier relationships. So tip number one is forgive yourself and others. When you are holding on to bitterness for someone else or for yourself, forgiveness is essential. Remember, forgiveness is letting go of the bitterness so you are free to love instead. Tip number two, stop comparing yourself. So often we compare ourselves to others wishing we had someone else's looks, their money, the relationship, the car, the house. But when you compare yourself to someone else, all you're doing is reinforcing that you're not good enough and you are good enough. Tip number three, stop criticizing yourself. That critical voice in your head is sabotaging any chance to love yourself and to love someone else. Instead, talk to yourself like you are talking to a child that is upset, being gentle and compassionate. And lastly, tip number four, accept yourself. You need to work on accepting yourself exactly the way you are. Understand and know that you are perfect. So if you'd like to learn more about me, you can visit my website at www.sandyscarlotta.com. So thank you so much for listening today, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Today's guest is Scott Jeffrey Miller. Scott was recruited by Dr. Stephen R. Covey's team and built a 25-year career in the world's most respected and influential leadership development firm, serving in nearly every role imaginable. Scott's professional roles evolved as he became a multi-best-selling author, radio and podcast host, leadership coach, columnist, and global keynote speaker. He continues to consult with Franklin Covey and is proud to continue their collaboration as he expands his own influence through new books, speeches, and coaching offerings. So for all the leaders and future leaders out there, this is definitely one episode you don't want to miss. Hello, Scott. It's so great to have you on today. How's it going? Sandy, the pleasure is mine. Thank you for the spotlight. It's going well. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we talked briefly beforehand. You're out in Salt Lake City, beautiful part of the country. Now, are you a snow skier? I am a snow skier. I'm actually from Florida. I spent my first 26 years in Orlando, Florida. And uh, when I left the Disney company after four years, I thought, well, where should I move? And so, Sandy, I actually picked the place that was the exact opposite of Orlando, Florida. No humidity, four seasons, no neon, <laughs> and uh, great elevation. So I, I, I'm raising three boys with my wife, and we're going to be snowboarding and skiing this weekend. Oh, nice. Yeah, I used to ski. I mean, I only ski. Being a former figure skater, it, it always came very easy to me. But what I learned, and I skied out in Deer Valley once, and what I learned very quickly is that I don't like going downhill really fast. <laughs> Well, then Deer Valley is good for you because it's probably the most posh skiing in America. Exactly. It was, it was very posh and I, it was perfect, but you know, I love going very fast on flat surfaces. <laughs> so yeah, skiing is really not my thing. Hey, said by a true um, ice skater. That's right. Yeah. It's got to be flat. So Scott, my podcast is all about, you know, stories of inspiration and like what got you to this place? So what, what is your backstory? What, what led you to where you are today? Because I know you're doing some really amazing things. Sure. So I, as I mentioned, I'm originally from Florida. I'm 53 years old, and my wife Stephanie and I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. Spent the last 26 years out here working for the Franklin Covey Company, of course, the leadership development firm founded by the famous Dr. Stephen R. Covey. Before that, I, I worked for the Disney Company in Orlando, which was an amazing ride. And after four years, they invited me to leave 
which is kind of a nice way of saying you're fired. Oh, goodness. So, you know, where does a single Catholic boy move? Well, of course, to Provo, Utah, where all the Catholics are. <laughs> That's a joke. It is a joke. I was like, wait a second, isn't it more Mormons out there than Catholics? Exactly. So 26 years ago, uh, I pick up my bags. I move out to uh, Provo, Utah to join this wonderful leadership development firm. And I've been with them for, gosh, coming on 27 years now. I was the chief marketing officer for a decade. I served as the vice president, executive vice president of thought leadership. And I am privileged to host what is now the world's largest weekly leadership podcast called on leadership with Scott Miller, I write a column for Inc. Magazine, and I um, I write books, many of which are Wall Street Journal bestsellers, and uh, I like to host um, interview series, radio programs, and it's all kind of coming together on your program today. Nice. So tell me about the books that you've written. I love hearing about books. Sure. So 24 years as a formal leader of people. I was kind of fed up with reading all these leadership books, Sandy, from these you know major CEOs talking about how great leadership is and leadership is life's biggest calling. And I thought, poppycock, leadership sucks most of the time. It is tough. <laughs> and, it's, and it's not for everybody. No, it's, it's like not. not everybody should be a commercial airline pilot or a anesthesiologist. Not everyone should be a leader of people. So my first book was called Management Mess to Leadership Success. 30 challenges to become the leader you would follow. And it did extraordinarily well, basically because I kind of talked about most of my leadership mistakes. You know, some of quite frankly were very blush worthy. And I just kind of opened the kimono, let it all out as a, you know, as an executive in the world's most influential leadership. Group. I said, leadership is tough. It's unrewarding at times and can be unrelenting. And not everyone should be a leader. The book did extremely well. So I followed it. By another book called Everyone Deserves a Great Manager, The Six Critical Practices for Leading a Team, where I was the uh, lead author with two of my very esteemed Franklin Covey colleagues. It, it, it became a Wall Street Journal bestseller, very practical book, based on the fact that, you know, the statistics show, Sandy, that the average age someone receives the first promotion into management is age 30. Yet the average age that same person receives their first formal leadership development training is age 42. So there's 12 years where well-intended people are just wrecking havoc in organizations. Then I followed it up with marketing mess to brand success from my years as a chief marketing officer. And I just recently released a new book based on my podcast. It's called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, based on um, 30 podcast interviews. I'm writing a new book on mentoring for Harper Collins and another another um, flurry of books I won't bore you with in the coming um, couple of years. Nice. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. So what is... Plus three boys under 12. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. That right there. <laughs> I have one boy. Oh, with all my personality to my wife's horror. <laughs> Boys are very active. I know my son is 21 now, but I remember when he was, you know, one and two years old, I thought, how could I possibly have a second child? (laughs) I can't keep up with this one. It's so true. (laughs) And, you know, in the wintertime now, when you've got three basketballs bouncing in the dining room, independent of each other, my wife like wants to run out screaming for mercy. Uh, Yeah, I can only imagine. So, wow, that's a lot. So, so leadership that's that's kind of the, the theme of, of what you've what you've written about and your podcast and everything. So what what are some of the key key elements that you talk about that are so critical to you know in today's world for yeah. for leaders? I think first and foremost, it's important to get the right mindset, the right the right belief system. You know, so many of today's leaders are promoted into leadership, Sandy, because they were you know, a great individual contributor, great individual producer. They were the most efficient dental hygienist, or they were the most creative digital designer or the top producing salesperson. And they then get promoted to be the sales leader or the leader of the creative division when it's often inversely correlated. The skills that make you a great individual contributor, what makes you a great leader. Things like having an abundance mentality and recognizing your job is not to be the smartest person in the room. Your job is not to be the genius, but rather the genius maker of others. That the effective leadership mindset 
I mean, you really can boil leadership down into the following phrase, and that is a leader's job is to achieve results with and through other people. I mean, think about that. If your job is to achieve results with and through other people, then everything you do likely changes. You become more patient. You are a better listener. You develop empathy that might not be your strong suit. You begin to find the time to train and develop the capabilities and capacities in other. You take delight when people actually get promoted beyond you or earn more money than you do. That you learn how important it is to make and keep commitments, to offer excuse-free apologies to protect your team against urgencies, including when you're the problem. I mean, I love a good crisis, right? And if one doesn't exist, I'm known to cook stuff up into a crisis, so I feel validated, and I do my best work under pressure. So there's so many things that I could talk about, but those are a couple of the top. I'll offer one more. I think another insight that I've learned is, as a leader, you've got to model everything. You've got to model punctuality, abundance, responsibility, apologies. You have to model what it means to be trustworthy because people will do what they see you do. And so it's, again, a reason why not everyone should be a leader of people because it is, it's a demanding position. So how do you get that across to, and I'm and I'm not, not trying to be discriminatory in any way, shape or form, but, you know, generally speaking, men, you know, their ego tends to get in the way. Sure. And, you know, as a leader, they, they, they want that ego stroked. They want to be the big man, you know? So how do you get it across to, say, a man who is resisting that and pushing back? Because everything you said about mindset is, I mean, I couldn't, I'm just sitting here shaking my head. You're like, yes, 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 yes. That's so important. How do you get that across to somebody that that is resistant? Well, I don't think it's you know necessarily exclusive to men, and you're not assuming that, but that's the that's the example you asked me to address. Yes. And by the way, I think you are right. I think I think oftentimes female leaders are much more empathic and better listeners and consensus builders. Men gen, generally tend to have a a proven streak of maybe self righteousness or you know undeserved confidence. Not everyone, but we know some. I bet you I probably fell in that category at some point in my career. I think maybe regardless of gender. Here's where I typically start is I really ask people, you know, that are, that are leaders, why are you a leader? I mean, and it's okay if your answer is I wanted to earn more money or I wanted to be in charge or I wanted to make the decisions. I just want you to be vulnerable and transparent and tell us the truth because the more you can understand your motivation, your why, the more you'll be able to, to better understand, are people going to follow you? You know, to quote the famous leadership author and a friend of mine, John Maxwell, you know, if you're a leader climbing a mountain and looking behind you and no one's following you, you're a hiker. You're not a leader. <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, post pandemic and perhaps even in the midst of or, you know, right in the throes of the great resignation, people are done with self serving leaders. People are over omnipotent, omniscient leaders. People are quitting leaders. People don't quit jobs. They quit bad leaders and corrupt cultures. Yes. In fact, people aren't quitting jobs and going other places. They're just quitting. Where are you going? I don't know. Where's your next job? Haven't figured it out yet, but I'm, life is too short now post-pandemic to work for any jackass that doesn't appreciate me or want to invest in me or thinks they know it all. Mm. People are quitting to go home and do side hustles, right? They can make more money on an eBay store than they can being humiliated by some jerk. That's a know-it-all. So what I do with leaders is I really talk about is, you know, what kind of leader do you want to be led by? Let's really talk about what does leadership look like in 2022? And it looks like those things I just mentioned is, you know, giving people feedback on their blind spots, moving outside your comfort zone and having high courage conversations. It means making sure people feel heard, making people sure that people can bring their whole selves to work that people have high standards and high accountability, but also have great flexibility in how they do their job, not just how you want to. I think you're seeing, Sandy, a sea change, regardless of gender, inside organizations, because every C-suite leader realizes now that culture 
is everything. Culture is basically how the vast majority of people behave the vast majority of time. And your leaders are the linchpin of your culture. And if your leaders are self-serving and self-dealing, if they're left to be unchecked, if they're harassing people sexually or verbally or physically or some other way, they're out. You're done. The, the, the tolerance for that justifiably is gone. And I think the, the, the working independent contributors have said enough is enough. As it should be. It should be done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, we don't need any of that for sure. So have you really, I mean, I, I've you know been working at home and I, I really do not follow the news very much because it just brings me down. And, How smart. Yeah. How smart. Yeah. So is there really a lot of this going on in corporate America right now? You know, I've been in corporate America for 30 years. I've never seen as rapid a writing as what we've seen in the last couple of years. When I say writing, I, I, I am not a fan of the cancel culture. I believe in giving people the benefit of the doubt and assuming good intent. I believe that, you know, great people can make mistakes and perhaps they're given a second or third chance, provided that makes sense and they own up to it and it was, you know, not, you know, malintended. I'm not talking about, you know, illegal or immoral or other behaviors, right? I mean, Something that crosses the line, crosses the line, you're out. But there is a sea change happening in organizations where no longer are you entitled to a leadership promotion. I think you have to earn it. You have to be thoughtful about why you want it. You have to be the right fit. And, and, and organizations are recognizing that the vast majority of the work is done at the front line. And you've often got the least skilled, least paid, least educated, least trained managers managing the largest number of people. If you think about it, your frontline leaders and your frontline managers, they typically have the biggest span of control. And if they don't know how to lead, their teams are going to quit in droves. They have massive turnover at the lower level. So I think you're seeing unprecedented training, coaching, mentoring, being invested at all levels of leadership because companies are now realizing People, the war on talent isn't even a war. It's like a nuclear war. And people are just fed up. And they've realized that post-pandemic, their values have changed. They realize how precious their one life is. And they want to contribute. They want to be heard. They want to feel respected. And they're not willing to tolerate a, pardon my phrase again, but a jackass boss for a single day. So how does a big corporation, let's just use Amazon as, a, as an example, because they they just moved their headquarters into the DC metro area where I live. And so that's really had an impact on a lot of other businesses in the recruiting area because Amazon is scooping up so many people. So in a company like that, how, where does that, how does it start? Because you've got to get the seed levels, you know, all, all the executives on board and then it needs to trickle down. So how, how do you work with a company of that magnitude and, and create that change. Well, you're exactly right. It typically starts from the top. We do this every day of the week, multiple times a day across the world for Franklin Covey. And we do just that, right? As we re-inculcate in the senior leaders what types of behaviors they want to see in all of their leaders throughout the organization. And then we remind them that you are the model. Like Dr. Covey said, be a light, not a judge. Be a model, not a critic. And so you're exactly right. It starts at the C-suite. And the C-suite has to absolutely reinforce and model and invest in the training for every leader throughout the organization. They have to show up to the trainings. They have to reinforce it through their email and through their town halls and through their own behavior. And when someone breaks the rules, they have to be swiftly um, admonished or coached or fired. Mm. Yeah. And then to to – put your money where your mouth is, is to cascade training throughout the organization to make sure that leaders understand what is expected of them. I mean, I, I don't want to demonize leaders because typically most leaders are great people. They're just bad leaders, not because they're sociopaths, not 10% are according to the science, but 90% on, aren't. Sandy, they're just typically untrained, right? They're they were the top sales performer for 17 quarters, so they got promoted to be the sales leader, and they don't know what competencies they needed to leave behind, 
like stop doing and what competencies that they're perhaps unconsciously incompetent about and be trained. You know, when you teach a leader how to have an effective one-on-one, -on -one, right? What is the right mindset of a leader? What are the types of behaviors you should be rewarding? How to give redirecting and reinforcing feedback? How to explain and talk about the why behind the what? How to live a balanced life? How to re-recruit your people constantly? To make sure you understand what are their fears and passions and joys and what is their career like? I mean, all of this can be taught. All of it can be taught. I think a lot of times organizations just don't realize the power sometimes the unchecked power that leaders at every level have over their culture. So you said early on that, you know, obviously there's a whole slew of bad leaders. Do you believe that anyone can be trained to be a good leader? Well, I'm going to answer the question differently. I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Here's what I do believe is I don't believe everyone should be a leader. I think what happens too often is, so many leaders, Sandy, are lured into leadership because in most organizations, it's the only way to get promoted or earn more money or, you know, have a, you know, in most tech companies, you can't get promoted if you don't have a standing control of 10 people. What happens is it lures people into leadership positions and they realize, oh my gosh, I hate this. I don't want to have high courage conversations around personal hygiene. I don't want to have to be mediating conflict between two employees that I used to be good friends with, and now I'm their leader. I don't want to have to have, you know, um, performance conversation with people. So I, you probably can teach most people to do it. The question is, is it worth it? Is this what their natural skill, what their joy is? Does this bring them fulfillment? Or do they trudge into office every day, dreading leading people because it's so taxing on them? It's an energy depleter and not an energy infuser. And then eventually they realized this isn't for me. And what happens, Sandy, is rarely then does someone step back into their previous role as an individual contributor. No, they quit and leave because it's horrifying. It's humiliating. Mm. So, so my answer to your question would be less, can everybody be trained to be a good manager or leader? And more is, has every organization clearly identified the competencies, both technical and also sort of interpersonal about what makes a great leader and to go out and talk to people. Hey, Sandy, you've been doing a great job for the last 17 quarters. You know, we have some leadership positions coming up and we're not exactly sure if this is the right fit for you. We'd love to talk to you around, you know, really what are your career goals? What does your future look like? And let's have a conversation around what it would be like to move into a leadership position and let's clearly identify which of your competencies are you going to have to leave behind and literally stop relying on and which competencies do you not yet have, but you can learn and we'll be teach them to you to make you a great leader. And is this worth the investment in you? And is this what you really want to do with your career? I think that happens hardly ever. I was just thinking the same thing. Like how often does that really happen? But that's everything you're saying seems like that's, that's where it has to begin. That's what I believe. You know, and here's a good example. I, I am that classic case, Sandy, of the person who was the top salesperson in the division, right? Met my quarters every quarter, year in, year out. And when the leadership position opened up, obviously I was the candidate because I'm the guy that always forecasted right. I always met my number. My clients were happy. I had problems, obviously. But I mean, here I get promoted. I'm about 30 years old and I'm a tyrannical jerk because I'm trying to turn everybody into another version of me. Say it this way, do it that way, fill it out this way, organize it that way, and people revolted. What I really needed to do was I needed to have the vice president, who, by the way, is my very dear friend to this day and my key mentor 25 years later. I needed him to draw a T-chart, like literally on a chart pad, draw a T-chart. Scott, on the left-hand side, here are all the things that make you a great salesperson. Bam, 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 and bam. Now, Scott... Six of these eight things are what got you this opportunity to become the sales leader. But quite frankly, Scott, six of these eight, you've literally got to leave behind tomorrow. You cannot do this anymore. And by the way, here are nine or 10 new competencies you're going to need to learn, not overnight, but quite frankly, 
pretty quickly. We're going to invest in you. We're going to coach you. We're going to have a mentor. We'll come alongside you and teach you. You're pre-forgiven because you're going to make some mistakes. Don't ever do this, this, and this. But beyond that, you're going to make some mistakes. We understand. And then to look at that and say, is this the right career path for you? Had someone done that for me, I probably would have still chosen to be a leader, but I would have avoided myself a lot of human resource file um, insertions, right? <laughs> My human resource file would have been less thick because they would have been very clear. I would have been much more clear on what it means to be an individual producer masquerading as a leader and what it means to be a leader achieving results with and through other people. Mm. Yeah, that, that was that was a really very clear example of, of how it should be done and not necessarily how it's being done. We are going to take a quick break from today's interview because I am so excited to tell you about a new program that I've just rolled out. It includes two group coaching calls each month to help you create the lasting happiness you so desire. It's only a $50 a month investment in yourself and you are worth it. So visit www.sandyscarlotta.com slash courses to sign up. I hope you enjoy the rest of today's interview. So, so what is your advice to anyone that is looking to get into leadership? What, is, what are some of the things that they need to be working on in order to be on that path? Well, first, I would be asking the questions, how? How do I do it in this company? Do I understand how to do it? Do I understand the success criteria? Have I interviewed people and looked around and understood what does this organization value? Do they value the skills that I have or could create? Do they value things that I don't value? First, ask yourself, how do I become a leader in this organization? Don't guess. Get very clear and talk to human resources. Talk to your leader. Talk to your leader's leader. Talk to other people that have been promoted leadership to get a real clear, clear path to understand how do I become a leader here, and is that what I want to do? The second, I would ask yourself, why? Why do I want to be a leader? If I'm, if you know, if I'm looking to maximize my income, could I have some other job or go somewhere else to make the same amount of money without having to do things that I hate? You know, a lot of people don't like having conversations about people's body odor. Or about their inability to take responsibility for their late projects. I mean, this requires a certain kind of talent and a lot of mistakes and practices before you get those conversations. Right? Yeah. So second, ask, your, ask yourself why. The third thing I would do is I would go to your leader and say, I am interested in a leadership track in this organization. I want to take on more. I want to do more. But I imagine there are some parts of my current contribution that could improve. I really want to make it safe for you to give me some high courage feedback on the things that I'm doing well and the areas of growth that I clearly have. I know there are some parts of my personality, my talent, my contribution that could improve. I have an inkling, but I really need for you to tell me what they are so that you become my biggest champion. Make sure you make it safe for your leader to tell you their truth about you. And when they do, don't refute it, dispute it, deny it, deflect it, or blame it on someone else. Just say, Sandy, my gosh, that's both embarrassing and so valuable. Thank you for telling me that. I honest to God had no idea. I'm writing this down. Can you share some examples of when I do that? And when I do do that, like, what do you think is going on with me? And what are some things that I could work on to immediately transform my brand and reputation around that? This is a long example, Sandy, but at the end of the day, if you want to become a leader in your organization, you absolutely must have your leader out being your champion. I can't tell you how many times I have a colleague come to me. They're looking to get promoted in the company. The first thing I asked them was, well, tell me about your boss, Sandy. What does she think about you? Oh, my gosh, Sandy loves me. I'm doing great. On, 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 on. Inevitably, I'll then catch Sandy in the cafeteria. I won't ask her why. I'll say, hey, Sandy, tell me about Jack. Oh, my gosh. Jack is a great news. Jack has not met seven of the last nine projects on time. He overspends everything by 20%. and gives feedback all the time on his declarative statements. He never asks questions. You get the point, right? Yeah. Now, shame on, shame on Sandy. 
for not having that conversation with Jack, but shame on Jack for not making it safe for Sandy. And that's a long diatribe, but I really believe if someone wants to move into leadership, they've got to make sure that they're making their current leader and perhaps their leader's leader, their biggest champion, by making sure they aren't seen as running from something to something other uh, else, but you're really delivering on what is your current responsibility. That's a difficult conversation to have with people. And that's probably why it doesn't happen, right? That, that is the absolute most valuable conversation you can ever have with your leader. Sandy, can I take some time? I'm really interested in the areas of improvement that you no doubt have for me. And Sandy will say, oh, no, Scott, you're doing a great job. I love you. You're fabulous. And you say, well, Sandy, thank you for that. But Sandy, I know there's got to be more to that. There have to be things that I could improve upon, whether it be with you know my strategic thinking, my collaboration skills. I'm really interested to know. I really want you to perhaps even move outside of what is natural or comfortable for you and give me some areas. The more specific, the better. Because just because you are the leader does not mean you have the diplomacy and the courage to tell me everything it is you're thinking about me that's going to help me build my brand. So. Oftentimes, the employee needs to lead the boss, and you've got to make it safe for your leader to tell you your areas of improvement. And when they do, if you just refute them or dispute them, then they're going to say, well, you know what, Scott, you really didn't mean it. You've got to go out and then let that person catch you behaving differently, and that is when they will become your biggest champion. It is difficult, but am I, you know – 30 years of coaching and moving up from the front line, literally to the C-suite in a public company, I don't think there's a more valuable exercise than the employee leading the conversation, soliciting feedback proactively, not disputing it or refuting it, asking for precise examples of when they could improve, and then going out and having their leader catch them behaving in a new way. Mm. And have you seen this happen successfully for people? You're talking to them. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes. I mean, like you said, Sandy, this is, you know, it's easier said on this podcast than it is done. But if you really think about it, I mean, I, I think there's very little to dispute here. I mean, no, I, I totally agree with you. I completely I, I, agree I, with you. Yeah. I, yeah. I have lots of employees. By the way, I'm actually quite adept at proactively giving my team feedback, because I think it's the biggest gift you can give your team members is to proactively give them feedback on their blind spots. You know, a very famous author, organizational psychologist, Tasha Urich, wrote a book called Insight, all about self-awareness. The statistics show that when asked 93 people, 90% of people out of 100, when asked, believe they are highly self-aware. And the feedback from statistics shows that it's somewhere between 10 and 15%. You know, I'm not as funny as I think I am. Uh, I'm not as genteel as I hope I am. I'm much more stern. I'm kind of ferocious. You know, I don't really know what it's like to be on the opposite side of a conversation with Scott Miller, which is why I ask all the time, what's it like to work for me? What's it like to lead me? What's it like to be married to me? What's it like, boys, to have me parent you? My boys have no shortage of telling me what it's like to have me parent. <laughs> well, and I so think the more, go ahead. the more you're willing to move outside your comfort zone and solicit feedback from others, you're only going to be able to use that to your benefit. Yeah. And, and I think it's all in the delivery too, right? It's in the delivery of how you're asking the question and the delivery and how you're answering the question. You are absolutely right. Because for example, When someone asks me for feedback, as you can tell, I have no shortage of courage. I'll talk to anybody about anything. I'll talk to you about, you know, the fact that your clothes are inappropriate for the office. I'll talk to you about your personal hygiene. I'll talk to you about your inability to ever say, you know, this was my fault and I own it. I'll make it right. Of course, the downside of that is I usually have a deficit of diplomacy. And so I have a fairly large personality. I have a fairly domineering style. I have been called ferocious. And so I have to be really careful, Sandy, when I'm giving someone feedback to understand what is the power differential, what is the 
physicality of the room? Should we go for a walk and have a cup of coffee? Lower my voice, talk more gently, be safe with some quiet space. Understand that if I'm not careful, I can verbally eviscerate someone. I can damage their self-esteem or their self-confidence. I want to give people feedback in a way that buoys them and makes them think, gosh, you know what? That was tough. And I don't agree with everything he said, but that guy cares about me. But I'll, I'll say to people, Sandy, I need to have a high courage conversation with you. My intent, Sandy, is not to embarrass you, to diminish you. In fact, my intent, Sandy, is the opposite. I want to share with you some feedback on some blind spots that I think are actually damaging your brand and are getting in the way of you having a phenomenal career here. A career, Sandy, that I can actually see being, being excellent in this organization. So if I, if I need to you know, have a do-over because I used the wrong word, please pre-forgive me. My intent is to help you. And then I go into the feedback. Mindful that I don't, I've never liked this idea of the golden rule. You know, you know, treat others as you want to be treated. Hogwash. It's the platinum rule. Treat others how they want to be treated. Because Jennifer and Maria may want very different feedback than Janice and Mark. Some may want it in private. Some may want it in person. Some may want it immediately. Some may want to like have it in private over lunch. Some may want it via email. So I have to be very thoughtful about making sure I know my team members enough to understand their sensitivities, their fears, their passions, their paranoias, their anxiety, what their goals are. And then I do my best to deliver to them unvarnished feedback, but in a way that they don't ever feel diminished or embarrassed, but they leave saying, you know what? That was tough. But I appreciate Scott doing that. Invariably, I'll be in an airport somewhere and someone that I had working for me decades ago, including those that I terminated, they'll walk up and they'll say, Scott. And I'll think, oh my gosh. And they'll say, Scott, you were a total jerk sometimes. But can I tell you, you were the one boss that had the courage to really call this out in me, and you were absolutely right, and I'm so appreciative for your work. You're what Kim Scott calls radical candor. Because the opposite, Sandy, of radical candor is ruinous empathy. And too many leaders are too cowardly to step to the plate in a private moment, declare their intent, and then have a courageous conversation. It might go sideways. It might not go how you want. The other person might become emotional. Oftentimes they do, which is why you, you know, go for a walk or close the door. You also have to be known as a lockbox. You're not going to say, oh, well, Sandy fell apart. And no, you can't, you can never disclose that with anybody else in the organization. That's how you build a reputation of being a great leader. Mm -hmm. Well, again, it's all in the delivery. And I liked how you, you said blind spots. And you also said, Please pre-forgive me. And, and just the way you set it all up is, is golden. I think so. Because when, you know, when someone says, I have some feedback for you, nobody says, I am so excited, right? They immediately get defensive. They sweat. They get nervous. Because everybody obviously has, you know, lower self-awareness than they think they do. And, you know, we all take things personally. And so it's, I think, super important not to diminish the clarity of the feedback, but to set it up properly. I have some feedback that I think is a blind spot for you that I really like to <coughs> consider receiving with the same intent in which I'm giving it, and that is to help you. And I'm open to answering any conversation or any question you have, talking about it more. But Sandy, here's a key point. When you're giving someone feedback on what you think are their blind spots, you really have to make sure that you're basing it on fact and not just your emotions or your opinions or your feelings or your jealousy of them. Very few people ever admit to being jealous. I am a fiercely jealous person. I admit it right here and right now. I'm not an envious person, but I am a jealous person. And so I have to make sure that when I'm giving someone feedback, I can actually base it in last week's team meeting. You said this, and here's what you didn't see happen on the Zoom call. Or last week, you sent this email to so-and-so, and here is the fallout from it. Be really thoughtful not to ground your feedback in just your feelings 
or your emotions. Or when you do, perhaps say that. Hey, Sandy, I've got some feedback for you. And, you know, I might not be totally right on this, but my sense is, is that when you do this, which I've seen you do on multiple occasions, this is the response you're getting from the team. Um, what do you think? Are you noticing this at all? Are you aware of this? Do you see it differently than me? There's so many ways to come about this to create a dialogue where the other person feels trusted with your intent. Because if you don't declare your intent, someone else will, as an as will ascribe an agenda to you. That's why it is so important to upfront use the words, allow me first to declare my intent so that they cannot be suspicious about your motive. Mm, yeah, that's key. Totally. So Scott, what is some of the best advice or one thing that was the best advice you've ever received? You know, when I was the chief marketing officer for Franklin Covey, I was countlessly being on media interviews. And people always wanted to interview me about Dr. Covey's famous book, The Seven Habits of Highly Efficient People. Well, of course, you and I both know the book is called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. They right. sound similar, right. but there is a radical difference between being efficient and being effective. This book sold 50 million copies. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, one isn't better than the other, Sandy. Efficiency is important, and so is effectiveness. What's important is when you deploy them. As you probably can tell, I am an extraordinarily efficient person. I manage my day in 15-minute increments. I know exactly what I'm doing for the next three hours. I know what I was doing since 4 o'clock this morning. I wake up every day at 4 o'clock. I write my ink column from 4 to 5. I write my chapters in my book from 5 to 6. I'm a dad from 6 to 7.50. I'm a husband from 7.50 to 8.30. And then I am an officer, an entrepreneur, and an author and a speaker from you know 8.30 to 5.30. I'm a dad. You get the point, right? I'm that annoying neighbor that gets up every Saturday morning at four o'clock. My car is washed by five. My lawn is raked by six. My, you get the point. And I don't apologize for my efficiency. I'm a very productive person. My default mindset is that of efficiency. It's really where my professional success has come from. My wife will tell you, Scott Miller gets more done than anybody she knows. Problem. Sandy, is when I move that efficiency mindset into my relationships. Because you cannot be efficient with people. You can only be effective. You cannot be fast with people. I sure try. I mean, I'm the kind of guy that orders the appetizers, the main course, and dessert all at the same time, and I ask for the check. <laughs> I always live in the future. Now, I don't live in the past, but I also don't tend to live in the <clears throat> present. I tend to live in the future. So the big learning there is more than you bargain for is for those of you who are like me and your strength, your go-to strength is efficiency. Don't be ashamed of that, but recognize that all strengths, when overplayed, can become your deficit, your weakness, your Achilles tendon. So recognize that when you're dealing with people, relationships, slow is fast fast is slow. You may have to like literally turn off your phone, take off your Apple watch, shut your computer and purposely check into the other person. Recognize when to be efficient, social media, some email, washing your car, walking the dog, and when to be effective, taking your son to get ice cream, playing basketball with your kids, going on a walk, with your partner or spouse, having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with your colleagues. Know when to be efficient and when to be effective. Oh, I love it. That is amazing advice. That was a much longer answer than you bargained for. No, I love it. Hey, it's great. So Scott, <clears throat> excuse me. I'll have that edited out. So Scott, is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience today? Goodness, I think I probably... Um, exhausted everybody. The current book that I'm most proud of is called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Your Greatest Minds by HarperCollins. 
it's sort of like chicken soup for the leadership soul, very fast, easy, and breezy. I write a chapter about 30 of my most influential podcast guests on the On Leadership Podcast. You can buy it everywhere books are sold. And if anybody's interested in learning more about me, you can visit scottjeffreymiller.com or connect to me on literally every major social media platform. Wonderful. Well, Scott, this was like just a wealth of information. And thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. So that was amazing. And as I said in the introduction, all the leaders and future leaders out there, take notes, listen to it again, rewind because there's so much information and I was taking notes and I couldn't keep up with it all. So, so much valuable information. So you can learn more about Scott at his website, which is www.scottjeffreymiller.com. So thank you so much for listening today. You can learn more about me at sandyscarlotta.com. My book, Happiness Solved, can be found on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. And you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Coach Sandy Scarlotta. So as always, I hope that you and your family are safe and healthy and that your lives are filled with peace, joy, and happiness. Take care, everyone.